Hello and welcome to Susie's Book Bag, hosted by me, Susie Fay. I've gone for my Stoke Newington Literary Festival bag for the following interview. I believe that is where I first met the author that I'm going to be talking to. I'm not 100% sure, but we definitely both hung out there fairly recently um, and it is one of our favourites. We are going to be talking music. We are going to be talking two-tone, probably a little bit of Beatles thrown in as well. Let's begin. Welcome into the book bag. The wonderful Daniel Rachel. Ta -da! Ta -da! Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, you good? I'm, I'm in Brummy Vernacular, Boston. Oh, let's have some more Brummy Vernacular. You can do the whole interview in Brummy Vernacular if you like. <laughs> I love a bit of Brummy. Oh, spent, spent a bit of time in that fine town. Um, really? Right. We are going to be talking about. Look at this whopper. Look at the size of this. We could almost call it a heavy, heavy monster tome, the nuttiest tome around. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, your latest, Too Much Too Young, story of two-tone records. Um, but you've, you've written lots of books, Daniel. I just want to, I'm just amazed to look at this. Um, this list, uh, previous works include Isle of Noises, Conversations with Great British Songwriters, Walls Come Tumbling Down, The Music and Politics of Rock Against Racism, Two-Tone and Red Wedge, Don't Look Back in Anger, The Rise and Fall of Cool Britannia. You like a subtitle, don't you? <laughs> yes, to, uh, to clarify the obscurity of the, uh, the main title. <laughs> right, I see. That's how it's done. Um, so you've, you've, as I've just kind of mentioned a book, you have written on two tone before, and I was also interested to see you co-wrote Ranking Rogers' autobiography. I just yes. can't stop it. My life in the beat. Wonderful yes. Ranking Roger. I'm sure we'll be talking about about him. Ah, oh, we love him. What a yeah, great book. He, he chose it. I think because he, he liked. Uh, the fact that sax, uh, the the Jamaican uh, saxophonist, yeah. was popping his head into frame. Oh, brilliant! Very good. Yeah, do do show other, do you show and tell? We don't show like show and tell. It's like being at primary school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my my primary school was opposite the Land Rover uh, plant in. Uh, oh. so yeah, yeah. You and are you are massive, massive, vast space, and I think it was the only place in Brit in in the world at that point that Land Rovers were made. So if you went anywhere and you saw a Land Rover, it's like, oh, that was done at the end of my road. <laughs> oh, a little bit of home <laughs> in a muddy field or somewhere. Yeah. Um, so uh, very sadly. Mm -hmm. A couple of people left us, left this planet while you were, while the book was in process. Uh, chief among them, aforementioned Ranking Roger and the very great Terry Hall. Uh, did you get, well, you obviously spoke to Ranking Roger, I imagine, when you, you work, worked on that book. But did you, did you get Terry Hall's input into the story of Two Tone? Well, yes, it kind of mostly no, but a little bit of yes. But there's been right. there's been many fatalities. I mean, Gaps has just died from the selector, mm -hmm. Bob Sargent, who produced all the beat records, um, singer like the Polonaires. I mean, all the, it's been over half a dozen since enjoying the writing of the book. I met Terry Hall a, a number of times, mm -hmm. and uh, but not in time for his. Uh, new contribution to this book, sadly. Right, right. What, what first was, was sorry? Uh, the first time I met him, I was in a guitar shop on Denmark Street, and um, mm. I was with a friend, and he knew I was a big fan. And we were looking up at guitars, and he said, "Terry Hall's behind you." And I thought he was just kidding because he knew I'd get because I was quite young, and I thought he'd get I 
you know, he just wants to get me overexcited. So as we do, we're like this, you know, looking. And he was directly behind me. And I got super, super excited. Think, you know, and all those things. What do you say? What do you... And I noticed that he was uh, playing the guitar. And then he went to leave the shop. And I went and introduced myself and had a really lovely chat with him. And then I just bought the guitar because he'd been playing it. <laughs> <laughs> he had touched it. <laughs> and then, like, two years later, when I realised, yes, that the holy hand that touched the holy guitar, and then I realised the guitar was actually not very good. I realised wow. I bought the guitar that Terry Hall hadn't wanted. Oh. <laughs> I went to an event recently, um, uh, and it was a guy who provides clothing and costumes for film yeah um, and, and he had various things on display that people had worn but the thing that blew me away was terry hall's suit that he wore in ghost town in in the the video for yeah. ghost town do you, think, do you think ray davis found a message from terry in the pocket when he oh. wore it for come dancing yeah you know it's the same suit isn't it in the kinks video is it really is it yeah. well this guy had yeah he'd done lots of um providing of fancy clothing and and the all-important suit i mean to go back to to two-tone of the book um the look is arguably as important as the music i mean the look of everything including the you know the design of the covers you, you go into all of that uh what people were wearing um, I just want to kind of spin back to the start of Two Tone. It's the late seventies. Um, punk is sort of, you know, it's sort of tailing off, I guess. And one of the things that's really interesting in the book is that you have Madness bunch of guys in London, and you have Specials bunch of guys in Coventry. And I think I think Britain was much more regional then. And they were sort of going, well, this is weird. How come two very similar things are happening at different parts of the country? So just paint a picture for us. What do you think was going on? Well, yeah, I mean, that is a wonderful part of the two-turn story. And at the same time, something's happening in Birmingham with the beat. And they will eventually get a, a copy of Melody Maker, I think, or NME, and see an article on the specials. And and uh, Andy Cox, the guitar player, threw the paper down in disgust to say we've been beaten to it. They're dressing not dissimilar to us and playing similar influenced music. And so that regionality, I think, yeah, that, that plays a huge coincidental part in the two-tone story that in all these different pockets of the country people were getting into Jamaican and Caribbean island music that was influencing their songwriting and the way that they approach music <clears throat> and I guess that what that reflects is going back to the ships that came from the Caribbean uh, most famously the Windrush and brought through the people that came to work in in what was known as the mother country, I guess, the, the, you know, ultimately they brought their their children, whether from from the Caribbean islands or because they were born in England, and so that the the repercussion of that is is you get first sec, second generation teenagers in the mid seventies who so black kids uh, that are being influenced by white culture. And, and and directly English culture and those English kids being influenced by Caribbean culture. And that was happening initially in school and then in youth clubs. And, uh, uh, you know, the influence is there in clothing. It's there in the records that you're listening to. And, you know, just a, just a general outlook and way of life. And so it's natural when those musicians pick up instruments that the influence of all of that goes into the music that you make. So was, I remember speaking slightly outside of two term, but speaking to, to David Hines, who formed Steel Pulse. And he was saying, you know, that he'd like, like many of the two tone artists, you know, that he'd grown up listening to the kinks and the small faces and the stones and the Beatles. And he'd learned kind of unusual pop chords for what would be reggae music and he had that influence and then likewise somebody like david Steele, 
or, or Rankin Roger even better example Roger in Birmingham was the first uh, black punk so he, he says and he was he was swept away by punk music which is not what maybe you'd expect a black kid of, of 15 and 16 to be saying and so you bring those people together and suddenly you get uh, a, a, an influence and, and it was there in the clash immediately that Paul Simon and Mike and Mick, Mike, Mick Jones because of their influence initially in South London and then later West London fused that idea of what the clash could be beyond um, just playing a punk style music. It was natural that Paul Simon would want to fuse in the influence of his record collection, which was played by a lot of black musicians. Well, there was a, a sort of punk reggae kind of meat wasn't there kind of um you know the punky reggae party sort of idea i guess that that it was already starting to interfuse but the interesting thing about two-tone and what you described really well is how it was taken on from punk i mean there are some punk elements in the we can't play music it doesn't matter we've got loads of attitude <laughs> A little bit of that comes into the story. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you get that. I mean, really, Nikki from the Body Snatchers, you says that quite a lot, and she mm. was very punk in her attitude, in her sense of boredom. <laughs> with that, there was she felt there was a base of nothing around her and music was a kind of an escape but music in the punk ethic of just get an instrument and do what you can be on stage and be what you can and so that when they started getting more learned criticism she would then be able to fall, fall back on that defense of we're just meant to have a punk ethic we're just doing it it don't you know just allow us to be what we are we're, but in but in truth i think that attitude w uh, is not pervasive across two-tone in fact most two-tone musicians are actually very good musicians mm -hmm. and have played um in various outfits before and even within the body snatchers uh, Stella on guitar and Sarah Jane on guitar had been in other bands. They just hadn't played uh, rock steady, ska, reggae influenced, or you know, uh, or, or in one of their cases, hadn't played electric guitar. They come from acoustic background in the same way as Pauline Black had played in folk clubs literally months before supporting people like Bert Yanch and uh, and, in, and into artists like Sandy Denning and then suddenly she's fronting a rock band but th so there these are uh, these are musicians who are suddenly in, in in fronting bands and a style of music that they're perhaps not used to because two tone as a genre had never existed before two tone mm -hmm. and but there, there is musicianship. Jerry Dammers, who forms the specials, Horace Pants, who plays bass in the specials, Neil Davis, who plays guitar in the selector. They've all got long histories of lots and lots of different uh, outfits and styles of music, covers, bands, trying their music in different outfits. But essentially, you know, two-tone builds on that punky reggae idea that you're referencing. But rather than trying to uh, be one or the other, are we now being a punk band? Are we now being a reggae band? They find a way of fusing it, and that and the and the, the critical link for the specials it is scar for the selector. It's reggae, but I I think you you have to realize or people have to realize with with two tone unless you consider everything that comes between the island music and particularly Jamaican music of the mid 60s to this point of reggae and all those points in between which is funk and soul and rock and then punk if you don't have those influences you will not have the two-tone sound amazing um we mentioned Pauline Black she's a she's a big figure in this um and tremendously interesting um and there's a moment when she takes the look on you know sort of starts to i mean she's so associated with that two-tone look and i she still seems to dress like that but that's quite a moment isn't it when she sort of oh there's the hat there's the jacket i'm good to go 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, it's exactly happening like that. She was being dressed and named backstage at a gig. And and what that belies is a, uh, a history of she doesn't know who she is, literally. Who are my parents? Who am I? What is my real name? Why am I being brought up in Essex, Romford, by a white family and I'm not white? I'm mixed. I've got mixed heritage. Who? What's that heritage? And then for fear, because she's working in a radiography department, a hospital in Coventry, for fear of being read about by a colleague in the music papers um, as a moonlighting, she needs a pseudonym. And, and at that exact moment, she asks the band around her, who am I? And mm. comes back the reply, well, you're Pauline, yes. And you're black. Yes, I am. You're Pauline black. Ching! <laughs> and something, <laughs> you know, she, Pauline feels as if that is something that, that's, that literally, in the, the naming of who she is, gives her an identity and that identity will be at first realized through uh, putting forward the idea of the rude girl. I don't, I'm not so certain she's aware she's doing it, but by dint of the clothes that she's wearing mm -hmm. and the fact that she's a woman, she becomes the first rude girl because you don't hear about rude girls in 1964, 65, 66 Jamaica, you get rude boys. Mm -hmm. And this reinvention of the rude boy that Jerry Dammers has, you know, through the, he's saying, Paul Weller has the mods. Strummer and Jones, the clash, they have the punks. If we're going to be a movement with the specials, who are we going to have? And Jerry says very early in 79, well, we could, we could have rude boys as our following. And he knows all too well what that means, but he's saying it in his kind of way. But there's no talk of women. And Pauline brings into the conversation women. And then when the Body Snatchers signed to Two Tone, um, having done their first gigs in November 79, suddenly you've got seven more women that join the brigade. And the idea then of Two Tone goes from being a more narrow male idea and becomes this. And then when the beat become involved and they don't appreciate a, a, a dominant male audience that is predominantly fighting and they introduce the beat girl as a way to diffuse violence they also introduce something counter to the two-tone man which is as dave wakeling the singer of the beat says something somebody for the two-tone man to dance with and dave mm -hmm. as it came out later we talks about being bisexual but more more interesting than that is that it transpires that the the figure of the beat girl is uh, Bridget um, Bridget and the uh, Bond. What am I talking about? I'm not getting the uh, Bridget Bond, who's a two tone artist in the mid sixties, who was a uh, I think born a man, and uh, and then became a woman or uh, in the 60s and so the beat girl is in in essence uh, the first transgender icon of two turn <laughs> see I they had it all i don't know how many skinheads know that when they had those tattoos put on their arms in 1980 and, uh, and onwards mm. yeah well uh, there's that whole thing of of uh, you know, the pushback against the bands and the violence at gigs where you had people who seemed to love black music but really not like black people at all. Uh, well, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's any such thing as black music. There's, there's right. music made by black musicians, you know. There's mm. no white music. There's just music made by white musicians you know Barry Gordy said mm. that there's no such thing as black music and that's good enough for me Barry Gordy thinks that <laughs> you know, no um, but yeah uh, um, but the violence is quite extraordinary really maybe it's something to do with how can Eric Clapton be influenced by so much music made by black musicians and then be the, be the direct stimulus for the formation of Rock Against Racism mm. because of his hideous and odious racist outburst in 1976, you know. I think it's something to do with 
you know, maybe black musicians look great on sleeves and sound good on a piece of plastic vinyl, but they're maybe not so welcome if they're your neighbour on your road. I think it's mm. something to do with that, really. It's it's liking different cultures at a distance. Yeah. But, that, yeah. but, that, but let's make sure that the culture doesn't directly influence my walk to my shop to buy my paper. I think it comes down to that kind of racism, really. Mm. Um and so the idea, you know, that these concerts, that many two-tone concerts were blighted by, I don't know whether they're racist, neo-Nazis, nationalists, people in young people who haven't got a clue but just need some kind of identity swept up in the moment. Whatever the thing was, these concerts fought, became battlegrounds, as many concerts of the era did as many football matches of the era were you know and so you have this situation where you go to specials gigs and the two black guys are being bottled or you go or the beat the three black people get the sharpened coins thrown up at them and and you have Zeke Heiling and in between songs and then and then suddenly everybody's dancing because they actually like the rhythms and they like the music. You know, it's I don't think ultimately any of the musicians in Two Tone have got their head around why they attracted such oppressive and opposite forces to what Two Tone represented. Mm. And, and madness, which I either never knew or I, I'd forgotten, their first single was a two-tone single. Um, I mean, they were a, a large sort of multi-personnel band and they were all white and they seemed to get quite a bit of this. I mean, they were put on the spot and asked to explain, you know, who it was they were... Um, who it was they were attracting to their gigs yeah. and they were they were generally pretty resistant about kind of i guess criticizing their own audience but they were a bit bewildered i think you know from from your book well as, as Suggs will talk about and does talk about he found through jerry dammers and found through two-tone a way of understanding and appreciating a greater world than NW5 and the kind of racist friends that he and other members of Madness naturally kept, were a part of and grew up with. And, you know, similarly, Terry Hall, went, I think, went on a similar journey of who you run around with when you're 14 and 15 is not perhaps when you when you're 16 17 and onwards when you start to develop your world view and you really are challenged by it and outside forces begin to say do you actually think these things or are you open to thinking in another way and i think many two-tone musicians went on the same journey as us fans did to realize that you could accept people of different cultures and it could be positive and madness become exemplars of that and although they only do one single on two-tone they become they they are definitely part of the two-tone family for a good couple of years in the music that they make in the concerts they do in the film that they end up contributed contributing to with dance grays and you know they're, so they're forever associated with two-tone but yes madness and bad manners you know attracted probably a, a harder core of yeah. right-wing activists and neo-nazis than the other bands or more frequently and they and and particularly i mean cattle uh Chaz smash struggled to articulate mm -hmm why he felt it was important to have a neo-Nazi in a concert, why it was important mm -hmm. to have a member of the National Front, the British Movement, the Vikings, in your concert. And he, what, I, what he wanted to say was, we can only change hearts and minds if that person is listening to the alternative argument. You can preach the converted, but where does that take you? Let's have the converted and the people are on our side and allow them to embody and 
in in in, in uh, you know influence through osmosis maybe a different mm -hmm. way of seeing the world and madness thought it was ridiculous that they should be charged with accusations of racism because and they because of the heritage of the band the influence of the band the what they like and they uh, 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 eventually they, they reacted as they needed to but not until 1981 when they mm -hmm. issued an unofficial statement against the idea that they were in any way racist. Mm. It's also important to note that this it was very much a kind of movement for working class youth. I mean, Two Tone was um, about expressing discontent with the situation, the, the situation as it was back then. I, I really don't know about that, Susie. I mean, the working yeah. class thing I've heard this ever ever since I've started reading journalists reporting on Two Turn or or books on bands around Two Turn, but I, I I struggle to know why that why it's labelled a working class movement. Right. I mean, have you ever been to a gig and been asked what class you are? <laughs> I suppose it. I suppose it's looking at the eye. Uh, one of the things is about you could get the clothes from from charity shops. You know, you didn't have to. Do only working get class go to charity shops. Then. Sorry, do only working class go to charity shops? Is is it the poor class we're talking about? I don't know. You know, maybe yeah. we are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Jerry Dammers, whose idea well, was to dress up in 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 uh, in second hand clothes. Is middle class. Horace, exactly. who bought his yeah. for seven quid from a charity shop, was middle class. Both of those were university educated. Pauline Black was mm. as well. She wasn't working class and uh, she'd done a degree. And by, you know, but we change our definitions of what class is, you know, and having a degree exactly. in 19 or uh, studying for a degree in 1979 was what, 4% of the population, 5% of the population went to a university. You know, this. You know, many there was upper class members in the body snatchers. Uh, there's members in the beat. Uh, certainly not. Uh, were certainly not working class, and were were other. And then of the audience, I simply do not know. I really don't know um, because I was aware of rudies around me and at school. Some of them lived in very posh houses. You know, or posh areas. <laughs> <laughs> but if people dress up as skinheads and, and in street clothing and street culture, the assumption is it's working class. And, and undeniably, it would have attracted vast swathes of the poor classes or working classes. But I don't know if I, I think that might I think this might be a rock and roll trope that right. rock and roll. We don't like to talk about the Strokes as being mid a middle class band who come from privilege, do we? But we, you know, because they're cool because they wore Converse. But we like to say it's about Keen <laughs> because they're an easier target. So we choose who we are working class and who we label as. And it's, I think it's easy to say, but I, I may be entirely wrong, but I'd like to see the proof to prove me wrong. Hmm. OK. So more nuance required at that yes. uh, about this issue. Fair enough. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the way the story goes is it's quite male dominated at the beginning. And then you've mentioned the body snatchers. Um, somebody says about Pauline Black. Oh, oh, my God. Poor Pauline. You know, she's the only woman on the tour bus. Um and in, indeed, at one point, somebody sort of tries to deck her, you know, or throttle her or whatever. She, she's um, she's an interesting figure from that point of view. Certainly at the beginning, she, she had to sort of hold her own a bit, didn't she? Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, just as a, from an author's point of view, before getting into that incident where Pauline was strangled on a bus, 39 men, one woman, you know, imagine... <laughs> Christ, mm. how could you get on with that? Um, by a member of her own band, um, mm. something you know, uh, screaming at her, you, you think you're the queen. <laughs> but from an author's point of view, I've always, I've always, from my very first book that I wrote, been conscious that a lot of music literature 
is written by men about men because the rock history of rock and roll is we are told is a history of men and i've often wondered how do i counter that because i don't want to be disingenuous to the history of the period by saying okay well we don't talk about the men and we change because you can't because that is the history but it's it's a responsibility that i feel strongly that i have to find the women that were involved that are are, va are as valid and have stories to tell and and if they are valid then to push them to an equitable status within the narrative so immediately from the beginning of two turn that figure is is juliet v juliet wills yeah. who at 21 um was co-running the two-tone office with rick rogers in london and then uh manage was became the manager of the selector and then obviously you mentioned poorly then you have the body snatchers um and then you know there are other women around the story but it's very but it's but in comparison to men as we would expect of 1979 80 81 there's a disparity but i'm, I'm just i'm just l naming the fact that i try to find some kind of uh equitable status within within the books i write but it is challenging for sure um and pauline is the great great uh example of this because as i mentioned you know there's no uh palette of uh of of um there's nothing to suggest that she would be able to front a rock band and she does because of her background and from the first footage and proof you can see of pauline black either in a recording studio or at live concerts she seems to arrive fully formed as the rock singer and she's incredible with it and i you know there's tapes of terry hall and demos of terry hall and he's weak and he doesn't hasn't got it and he's trying to find his voice and he's and you see the transition from special early specials commentary, commentary automatic demos of 88 early recordings in 79 terry's not there and really i think the too much too young ep is really where he absolutely nails the strength of his voice and that's even after the first specials album whereas pauline you know first time in the studio is recording on my radio just the, just listen to the sound of her voice on that it's like she'd been in the studio all her life she's so it's so rounded and full and then you watch footage of her yeah i've got an inordinate amount of respect for for her and she was originally part of the work uh, workers revolutionary party and they got this huge political background and you know brings in new elements to two turn or fortifies ideas that other members have to give a social and political um backdrop and um substance to what the two tone movement could could and was could be and was could be and was um i mean going back to terry hall i mean i think i think he's just a he was just a brilliant front man yeah. but just very odd and there are still people in the book that say well of course terry couldn't sing <laughs> terry couldn't dance terry was stiff terry, i mean all those things weirdly came together to make him completely magical in my view and very watchable i think uh, i think terry was magical and completely watchable and one of the mm. great men of our time and i think he was a, a brilliant singer and it's the reason i've ended up following him through every incarnation from boy three color field vegas mm. mushtack you know his solo records you know he, he was the pop star we grew up with and he ne and he was a brilliant pop star too and yet there yeah you are there's pete waterman of stock aiken and waterman tell, telling terry hall that he needs to dance 
<laughs> he's not there. And there's Bernie Rhodes, the manager of the Clash, who would, for five minutes, manage the special, saying Terry Hall can't sing, and even going into Rough Trade Records at the time, a gangster saying he's not the right person. Whilst at the same time, as I believe, Bernie Rhodes wanted him to front the Black Arabs, which is the disco tracks on the great rock and roll swindle you know the disco oh, right, yeah. in the uk and that imagine terry <laughs> <Holland from that. laughs> Just funny because jerry because jerry damage went down to london to get johnny rotten to front the specials yes yeah so yeah. but yeah <laughs> um i mean i'm sure we'll um we'll talk about it a little bit later on but uh, in lost album of the beatles you're sort of going down some of these other pathways into alternative musical histories and what ifs and yes. I mean, some of these ideas are wonderful to contemplate um so jerry dammers did you do interviews with him for this book i've, I've i had a collaboration with jerry for maybe right. uh, over two year period where right. we met several times we've phoned multiple times we exchanged many many emails and and texts uh and so his contribution was quite large um uh yeah so that was you know in my first port of call to write a book about Tutan was to go to the fountainhead and say this is what i would like to do i you can't i, I can't do this unless it has your involvement, approval, hmm. whatever the right terminology is, and that's what I did. At the same time, it can't be the Jerry Dammer's story, can it? I mean, you've, you've made it a story of many voices. How do you balance somebody as, as strong and forceful, uh, you know, an ideas guy like Jerry Dammer's without, um, you know, without having him dominate the whole book? Well, I think that Jerry's the protagonist, and right. that be that's how that be you considering how any author uh, takes their reader through the story through the eyes of their protagonist, isn't it? So, you know, the the more that you bring in other characters and subplots, the stronger the story and the depth of the book becomes and so that's my approach really it jerry is the protagonist and it and he's there almost from the very beginning although the story as you well know starts with the bombing of coventry in 1940 but he's he's the person then at the the one who flicks off the light of the two-tone office <laughs> when it's all collapsed around him and he just wanders off with a bag full of debts but it's really, you know, there's so many subplots and exciting avenues to go off on, then that it, 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 the story almost tells itself, you know. And 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 because I met near a hundred people, I think, uh, to tell this story, I had so much source information. Um, within any one band so within the specials mm -hmm. uh, off the top of my head i don't know how many i spoke to four or five of them possibly six and then the same across every one of the bands so in each subplot you've then introducing another set of or, or cohort of people that can really give a kind of a substance and depth to that part of the story and but it but, but always the guiding hand of jerry was over two-tone and and so they all reference him and you feel him and it, it just felt brilliant and beautiful as an author to have all that kind of wealth of material to to work with yes i suppose um what i mean is you can't just be a mouthpiece for one person uh, because I, I mean, this is a movement that had so many competing voices and actually people who didn't get on with each other particularly well and people who just have a different view. So Jer Jerry Dammer's view, while it's fundamental, it is just his view and his perspective and other people do have well, different I, perspectives. Yeah, I just simply put the other perspective in. <laughs> exactly. and, I think, yeah. and, that's, and, and, and I'm really pleased that that's 
been picked up on by multiple, multiple readers. And in, and in most reviews I've read of the book that I haven't been, I haven't shied away and I certainly wasn't scared of putting oppositional views. I would say that's something I've perhaps done in all of my books, really, because the world is never that simple. And as you're suggesting, it's not one person's view of the world and any one situation. Um, with the specials were involved, there would be at least 10 other eyes experiencing exactly the same moment. So if I show them as many as possible. If they create a drama that's true to a situation, that's the essence of drama is the essence of any storytelling, isn't it? I just want to see if I can find this passage that really made me smile. Um, and okay. it's somebody that you're quoting. Um, about it's a member of the specials actually where um oh here we go uh it's somebody called roddy byers um on paper it should never have worked you know it's all the different influences and and he says um linville this is about what they thought they were doing linville thought he was it was scar Brad thought it was Tamla Motone. Neville thought he was you, Roy. Horace thought it was a funky type Little Feet band. I thought I was in The Clash. Jerry thought he was in an avant-garde jazz group. And Terry thought he was in The Cure. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Why would that, why would that work? I and mean, it works. <laughs> Because of all of those reasons, yeah. Exactly. Roddy was so, fantastic. Yeah, because yeah, Roddy thought, was that just nailed it really for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just wonderful. <laughs> he wrote he wrote so many good songs, the specials, Roddy, and uh, and he had a look, he had a great close friendship with Jerry, and then they were like that, and then they were like that, and mm. unfortunately, mm. that becomes a backdrop of a lot of. The special story the you know roddy one minute going to stab jerry jerry being outraged that his hands are about to be mutilated by the guitarist knife and uh you know kick this person out and um and yet at the same time if you were to kick him out you immediately you don't have the specials yeah. he was so integral to the sound of it to the look of it you know there's a chemistry in any band and you take away an element of that and you've got a new, you know, you've got something, a new chemical, yeah. whatever. Maybe <laughs> something that maybe mind. something that doesn't work. And the selector were uh, notoriously difficult. And um, there's a great quote from Pauline Black about... Um, that was in a documentary where she said that the one hour on stage was great. The other 23 were terrible, <laughs> their experience of the band. But um, they were particularly at loggerheads. You yeah, know, I mean, madness well, all seemed to get on. Madness seemed to have a blast, <laughs> but Selector, not so much. Well, you've got, you've got more than half the band that have come from the Caribbean islands when they're eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, they haven't seen their parents, some of them in 10 years. They're thrust into a country where they're suddenly experiencing racism, something they've never come across before. They're, uh, they're, they've struggled as kids, as teenagers. They fear the white man. They think the white represents authority. And yet the hit singles of this band are being written by a white man. And uh, and he's formed the band essentially, and that is a great source of antagonism. Then they've got a white manager who, on top of everything, is twenty-one and a woman, and um, that doesn't. You know, you only have to listen to interviews with Peter Tosh to know how a lot of Jamaican uh, artists treat women. You know, some. I think he said that they deserve his wife is, needs to be beaten once a month. I think was the quote. Uh, he gave to Vivian Goldman, you know, and that's that's the outspoken Jamaican telling you how it is, you know. Um, I'm not saying that that's pervasive across uh, that culture or anybody's culture, but it's certainly pervasive across our culture, as we well know. You know, the mm -hmm. violence against women is a, is 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 um, defines 
you know, our country in many ways. Um, so the, that owes antagonisms and that kind of sense of violence within the selector is evident. And they talk about it in the, at the time in the media. They talked about it to me. They talk about it in the book. And it's that anger and angst, I think, that lends the band the um, edge and excitement that we get. But it's also, as obviously, it's inherently where the downfall is going to come. And it comes within a year, you know. They just can't cope with one another. It's a very, very sad story. And, of course, on stage, the selector manufactured a fight sequence during too much pressure <laughs> where they'd literally drop their instruments and have a fight to show to the audience the meaningless futility mm. of violence to try and stop the violence in the audience but of mm. course the violence and the anger within the band overflowed <laughs> and so members of the band were getting a kicking by their own band uh, and the theater had somehow got forgotten <laughs> yeah there's something really interesting that sort of flows through the book um, that I really enjoyed, which is the music criticism, the the journalists latching onto this new story, this new sound, and yeah. how um, individual singles were received, um, and what part journalists played in the whole narrative. I mean, I think... I kind of miss it in a way. We have a very different um, scene now where I guess music writers and reviewers are not, not so important, but um, they were crucial back then, but also somewhat of an irritant for the bands. And I think some of the, some of the writing that you quote, I mean, is it, um, is it Dave McCulloch's startlingly, um, startling use of the N word? <laughs> um, was it interesting going back and looking at that literary culture around music? What do you think of all of that? Yeah, no, I mean he is startling, isn't it? And and he and and I, and there's another journalist that starts off by saying, "I hate the beat. Why have I got to go and now interview them?" And <laughs> what a start, you know. I think what was important to me was to flavour the book with the attitudes of the time and because i'm really trying to place the viewer back in the viewer <laughs> the reader in that period and so certain gigs are celebrated certain records are celebrated and then other times they're not or suddenly there's a, a massive criticism even in early 1980 against two-tone and you know i i i, I was a musician all my life until the moment I wrote my first book. And there's that kind of uh, natural antipathy towards journalism and journalists and that feeling that journalists really haven't got a clue what music's about because, you know, I mean, I just came back from Glastonbury and there was a write-up of a band by a journalist and um, somebody read it out to me actually. And the sentence lasted, you know, for about, I mean, you had to take about six breaths before there was even one, the first full stop. And I didn't actually understand it because it's always a kind of a use of strange similes and metaphors and big words that you put them all in as if this describes music. But it, I, I often just come out thinking, I have not a clue what you're talking about. And it tell, you've told me nothing about. So there's this strange thing about journalism and music, which so. But in saying that, you know, then you get the brilliance of somebody like Mark Ellen, who mm -hmm. describes what it was like to go to certain gigs or David Hepworth, and it just nails it. And you just think some of these people really have got a skill and a craft. And uh, and it was just wonderful to be able to. And they were writing for smash hits. And I love the idea that smash hits was the source material for so much of the journalism around two-term because i think perhaps it's easy to think it was an nme thing and then you know who read and you're going back to earlier who read smash hits was that working class uh, readers or was you know was because it's glossy magazine does that more is is the implication if it's more middle class magazine i don't know what was smash hits who were the readers 
I think everybody read it. I mean, at one point the writing was so good. Um, I can't, I can't think of the name now. There was actually a, a, um, a music memoir written not too long ago about writing for smash hits and um, because they were so funny yeah you know they they took everything they took everything more lightly i suppose this was a sort of counterbalance to the kind of paul morley grimly serious <laughs> sort of very yeah. polysyllabic long 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 sentences i mean i love paul morley i really love his writing but but they had this they brought this sort of zest and silliness and sense of fun which is also yeah also part of music exactly and two-tone was all over smash hits and that that, that was a mm. massive massive contribution as it then you know you know jerry was on the first issue of the face and you know mm. the center spread about stuff again a different kind of an audience suggesting that two-tone isn't just working class in certain fanzies or in certain inkies but yeah i, I don't know i mean in other books i've 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 not ever spoken to journalists and I didn't speak to any journalists for this book either, because I always try and get to the center of a story. And the and journalists sometimes are the people that are reporting on a story. And, yeah. in, and it's whether the reportage is an important facet. So when I wrote about Call Britannia, Call Britannia, for Don't Look Back in Anger, about the 90s, Call Britannia was defined by journalists essentially in america you know vanity fair they played a huge part in what was to be known as cool britannia and so therefore it became very important to speak to them as journalists because they played a critical role in it but within two-tone yeah it's a different kind of culture or, or influence so i quote them but didn't actually meet them yeah it's i mean you quote contemporary reviews which is yeah. fascinating because over time certain things sort of become very you know codified like oh they are great this was a yeah. brilliant song and the funny thing about journalists is um critics of any description is how often they get it wrong in terms of what the ultimate decision is you know like the immediate you've, you've got to come up with something, go to a gig, listen to a single, listen to an album, write something that week. Um, and it can be quite funny how off some of those instant yeah. judgments are. But at the same time, they're part of the narrative that was around yeah. at the time. And I, I did And I'm also to try not to let my fandom take over. Like there's quite a lot of criticism of a couple of selector singles, which personally I thought mm. were fantastic. Mm. But you know, I can't just be writing, but this is brilliant and they're yeah. wrong. You know, it just yeah. doesn't wouldn't be authentic or right. Or, you know, that there's a I think it's Vivian Goldman lambasts the first specials album and then the specials play it. Brighton that night and Terry calls the journalist a stupid cow for what she's written, you know, and this is, so there's a kind of a reaction from the bands to the, to the journalism and what's being said, you know, and it's part of what's happening. And uh, yeah. And then, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you can, yeah. But this is about music and musicians and not a book about journalists. Sure. Which has sure. become like a thing now, hasn't it? In publishing. You know, it's like I am I was the journalist that, you know, like John Savage said, you know, how many people can we, how many more people can write books about the clash and their journey on the 47 bus to a certain gig, you know, and there has to be a limit. <laughs> so I just want to talk a little bit about Lost Album of the ah. Beatles. Um, very, I mean, it's very different to go from one to the other. Um I mean, you've, you've written on Two-Tone before, and I think, uh, did you curate an exhibition or something? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, in Coventry, yeah. For the city so you're Coventry. obviously, you know, steeped in this stuff, but where, where did the Beatles book come from in your musical repertoire? From my passion from being an eight-year-old kid. I mean, uh, I was born when the Beatles were still together, just about. <laughs> final just doing the final hurdle of abbey road yeah and I, I i it was my first musical love and it's still you know i mean if you're not 
if you don't like the Beatles, and what are you doing in the world? You know, it's just <laughs> the greatest band ever. And uh, and and me and my mate um, Simon from Ocean Colour Scene, when we were living together in our twenties, you know, he came up with this idea, saying, you know, because we'd always been listening to this song or that song uh, that was done by a Beatle after they'd left, and he'd be going. Oh, if only, if only maybe I'm amazed had been done by the Fabs and hadn't been on Paul's first album. What would that have been like? Or jealous guy that actually got it together in time to record. And so Simon would start saying, you know, when he had far too many spliffs or whatever, you know, could imagine that record and uh, we call it early 1970. What would it be? And, you know, we'd get drunk and stoned and whatever and just share it between us. And then sometimes we'd be down the pub and we'd start saying, oh, imagine this and imagine that. And people would join in. And it was a fun pub parlor game. And when I came to the point of considering it as a book, I was, I was it was, could this be a book or is it just a pub game? And, <laughs> and can I express my passion for the band in something genuine that's worthy of being a book and although it's um it's based on a fantasy idea i what would that album have been had they released it in 1970 there's n there's not a single word in the book that isn't fact so mm -hmm. i i quote from the beatles at the time all four of them the people around the beatles and every single choice is because the of song is because the Beatles, the members of the bands wrote it while they were Beatles or the Beatles recorded it or rehearsed it or demoed it. And, and, and essentially a big part of that book is trying to understand what was happening between the four of them as people in mm. 1969. And I, I, and I had access to a hundred hours of audio tape of the Beatles in January 1969, recording Get Back. And that that was unbelievable. In I mean, I've got tons of Beatle books everywhere and records, but there's nothing I've heard more than those 100 hours of audio that gave me a greater sense of what it was like to be in a rehearsal room with the four Beatles as they tried to create music. It was astounding and it's uh, and, it, and I use that very much as this springboard platform to try and create and give to the reader. This is where they were. This is what they were up against. This is how where they were as people. This is how close that record came. And then, you know, in September 1969, John Lennon said, we do another album. This is after Abbey Road has been done. We do another album and he kind of outlines what it could be. And that's the actual, that's the core of the book, John's conceit that we can do it again. Mm. Yes, it's not It's not a complete flight of fantasy. It's not you sort of going off and making stuff up. Everything is um, very tied into something that could so closely have happened. That's what's tantalising about the book. Um, and I was um, I was very taken by the um, the portrait of of Yoko in it um, oh. because you you know you're quite positive about her her influence overall, which a lot a lot of people are not. Mm. Well, why not? You know, if you've just if you've been to take. Uh, modern recently you know you can see very oh, clearly yeah, yeah. yeah that here was somebody who had who through fluxus uh, mm. was an artist who had her own status and who strangely mm. allowed herself to be subjugated by john in in the sphere in the beatles sphere you know we mm. did we and when we see the peter jackson footage She's 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 pulled herself right back, hasn't she? See, there's some moments where she's she's doing some calligraphy, and then later she expresses herself as a vocalist um, in the jams, and that kind of style of music is what we go on. To, but for considering what she was and who she was, you know, it's it, she she's been lessened, and yet you know she's a very uh, you know she's a um, she was an a, a, 
an attractive woman that a beetle fell in love with and the world criticized her not the beetle mm -hmm. for falling in love with a woman who then said i change all the previous rules where we never allowed some in the studio i now will want yoko in there because she needs to convalesce i want a bed for yoko you know mm -hmm. i want to go and make this music because i want to do it with yoko everything's john and if you want to blame somebody for that period mm -hmm. and, and and breaking the beatles the fab bubble it's john and as much as i adored John and the door and still do as a musician and as a songwriter and as a Beatle. It's that's he's the one, but it's far easier to blame a woman, especially if she's not mm -hmm. English. And um, even more so if she's from a culture that in 1968, 9, 70, 71, very few people have got any knowledge of, you know, except that she comes mm -hmm. from a place where we try to drop a bomb. Yeah. We yeah, did. the well, yeah. Um, the ex the exhibition is is absolutely extraordinary in terms of its range, and the um, the film of cut piece is really distressing. Actually, I mean, the guy who is just literally cutting her clothes off her, it's and you 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 see her flinching as well. You know, it's and also you, that's where. Obviously, M Marina Abramovich was directly influenced from, wasn't it? You know, yeah. and there's Yoko doing cut piece in what '64 was it? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and yeah, and it's an incredible piece of film. Yeah, she's quite young, and um... and all the all the all the, uh, all the excerpts from Grapefruit, and of course, amongst that is the, is is lyrics from the song Imagine, which at that point John didn't credit, and later would credit Yoko as a co-songwriter. Mm. So again, this is this is part of your thing of kind of giving the feminine some credit in this mostly very masculine world. Exactly. I mean, it's not, I, I, and it almost sounds like it's um, not fake, but it's just naturally who I am. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't live in a world exclusively <laughs> led run by men just blabbing on. Really, it's just. <laughs> much more can you you know <laughs> so much more be boring it would be my life but... um just to ask about one last question about this book yeah. um what sort of feedback are you getting from readers and I'm, I'm kind of wondering who the readers are are the readers people who were around at the time or is this music that is going forward through time and there are still people listening to it and being inspired by it yeah, I mean, yes to all of those things. I mean, uh, I mean, the reviews have, have, have been masses of them, which have just amazed, I'm amazed really. And I think it's probably now outselling anything I've ever previously written. You know, the hardback had three runs and sold out. The paperback's on its second run already uh, with a um, new artwork for the third run. Um, and I was very nervous before it came out because I really didn't know how it would be received because it's very, as you know, it's revealing a lot of truths um, and then they're uncomfortable truths. Mm -hmm. And yet, I mean, I, I, I haven't read a bad review of it. I mean, they've been exceptional um, and it's won lots of, included in lots of books of the year. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've met, multiple multiple people because i've been doing events now it's mm -hmm. now what, july and i'm still doing events virtually every single week and i started doing them in october and mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, on social media i've had hundreds and hundreds of comments and, and and everything is incredibly positive where the negativity is is coming from uh several musicians in the book who uh i've found it um uh i've found the way i've done it not flattering to them and they've reacted against it because they don't think i've been fair to them or uh i i, I really approach books in terms of balance of a contributor and my way of going okay if there's something if somebody's been if somebody's getting knocked here 
and there's a lot of negativity about this particular moment. How does that, how do we feel at the end of the story about this reader? What is, and I'm very conscious of that idea. And I feel that certain musicians hone in on a particular sentence and go, you said that about me. And therefore you're rubbish. The book's rubbish. You know, <laughs> everything you ever try and do is rubbish. And I'm being, I kind of slightly been told that by some, and I was told that by, <laughs> I was told that before that this book was one of the worst books that ever been written. So I was, I was dreading it coming out because I thought maybe that would be replicated by everybody. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't set out to hurt people and I don't try and equally hide from something that happened and mm. other people feel strongly about or emotionally about um but uh, yeah as i said i know yeah i've upset people and i'm i have no intention of doing that but i i have to i have to accept I, and it's sad for me because they're they're people that have contributed to music that i still love and that's hard did two-tone have any impact across the atlantic and by extension would would the book come out over in the states well, it came out in June, and right. in, and I'm about to do. I'm, I'm going to the states. I'm doing a 12 date tour, a book tour from Los Angeles all the way across to New York, with dates all the way in between. And it's like a wow. dream, a dream come true uh, to tour the states with something that's a creative, a creation. You know, I can't wait. And the reviews are happening at the moment. Um, uh, and they've again they've all been really positive and they're talking about there's a lot of comparison to the third wave of scar which was a big influence in the early 90s and mid 90s generated by artists like no doubt and gwen stefani who were directly influenced by two-tone and pauline black so and the specials appeared on saturday night live in 1980 and for many Americans, that moment was as important as when the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan show for the first time. And that, so the reverberations of two tone, particularly on the West Coast and the East Coast, I think is fairly strong, although it's mm -hmm. not represented massively on the Billboard chart. You know, you get Our House and maybe It Must Be Love as hits for madness, but the other bands, there's, they don't really chart. And yet they played fairly big gigs you know, several thousands. Um, so when something's underground and independent in the States, I don't quite know how big a reach that can have in the same way as, you know, underground in this country can mean the Smiths or the Lars, and yet they can have they can be quite big, yeah. but they're underground. So I don't, I, I, yeah. I'll know when I come back from a tour. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It'd be very interesting to hear hear about your adventures. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap up with my three questions um, that you didn't think about beforehand. So let's see how we go with these. <laughs> kind of rude of me. Sorry, sorry, Susan. Oh no, that's that's okay. Let's be spontaneous. We love spontaneity in the book bag. Um, so, uh, do you have a favourite artwork? Uh, I th when two came to mind straight away, uh, the f gosh, as, as as I just said that, the load jumped into my mind. I'm a big fan of the young British artists. Um, a lot of that, like Damien Hurst spots, I think he's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I remember in the early 90s i went to the british tape britain and i went into a darkened room and there were four mark rothko originals oh. and i didn't last very long in the room and i didn't really get it and a friend of mine was massively into rothko and i remember she she told me and was speaking to me about it all and what I've found is in the, I was living in Birmingham at the time. And before I got back to London and went to that place again, which I did do, a long time had passed. And I'd been thinking about it in all that period of time. And it had somehow got into my mind. And, I, and the second time I went into the room, 
I suddenly re- been in there for half an hour and I'd been just staring into the depth of these colours. And then the, the whole thing happened again. And the next time I went there, I, I, I don't know, I've probably been there for three quarters, an hour or an hour. And I realised it had this in, incredible impact on me uh, to, uh, to something that I just thought was red. <laughs> it's yeah. just a, just, there's some red and then it's like became like wow that is extraordinary absolutely extraordinary and the, and the other the other artist that has had a similar impact on me is edward hopper uh, i mean and there's a, a very bad one there i think oh, right. one, <laughs> that one. yeah there's a, yeah. a woman here uh and the screens here and she's the working at the cinema. And of course, there's a couple of low men as there always are in Mar- in Rothko's. Yeah. And there's always a sense of an ex in Rothko, you know, Hopper. There's a sense of an exit with the stairs. Glowing. Yeah, the romance of what's happening here. There's a sense of is she looking at nothing into the middle distance, or is there some form of a relationship with the man? You know, and that's across so many Hopper. You know, when I went on my second solo album, A Taste of um, Money, I wrote a song called Hotel Room, which I think is the title of a Hopper um, picture. Um, and and I, I tried to write a song about sharing my, well, imagining the characters in it, which was sharing my love of art, the art of Ebbs Hopper. Have you ever seen an exhibition with lots of his work or you just come across them individually every now and again? Um, I went to an exhibition and it was the first time I ever bought a uh, the catalogue book and yeah. I was on the dole at the time and it cost me £40. So it was a massive, massive investment. And I had a scooter, Vespa, and, uh, and as I was going along Millbank, uh, my bag fell off and the <gasps> book fell off. And uh, because it was in a bag, there was some wine and the wine smashed. And a, and a lorry went over my bag. And when I got my book out, it was kind of tinged with red pages from the wine and kind of slightly crushed. And I, I love the book all the more for it. <laughs> Get you with your art books and your red wine <laughs> on the dole. <laughs> Why didn't I have red wine? Yeah, but that was it. I was so in love with what I've seen. I thought I've got mm. to buy this book. And I, as I said, I'd never bought one before an art book. So, yeah, yeah. It, it obviously really hit me deeply seeing the exhibition. Mm, brilliant, great story. Um, okay, <laughs> do you have a um, do you have a book of shame, as I'm calling it, something that you haven't read yet and you really ought to have? Uh, I don't, I don't buy into that idea. People say that about records, that that, that phrase, guilty secret, guilty you know. pleasures, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Since if you like a record, just like it, you know, I don't care yeah. one thing or the other. I, I, I do wish I enjoyed Shakespeare, and I don't. Oh. And I've only read three or four Shakespeare plays. I've probably seen at the theatre 20, 30 performances, <gasps> I don't know. And I don't, I just don't enjoy it. I don't, I can't find my way in. I remember in, um, I remember I met an actor. He was the guy who was the neighbour in Rent a Ghost. And uh, we went to see, I went to see Much Ado About Nothing, the first Shakespeare I ever saw, uh, 1988, at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford. And I had a, I blagged a ticket somehow. And uh, my mum, I went with my mum because she could drive. And, uh, and she said, that's your uncle on stage. And it was rent to ghost uncle jeffrey and so we went backstage after and he ended up coming around our house and i told him that i thought shakespeare was irrelevant and uh and we'd be far better off studying mike lee and i remember mm-hmm. having like, this massive debate where he stood up for shakespeare and i stood up for mike lee and i don't ultimately think my view has changed that much <laughs> it's, not, it's not for want of not trying but I, yeah so so in sh- the short thing is, I've I, I, I've, I've read ve- very little Shakespeare. Right. Wow. That's um, that's not something we've heard before. But you've given it a go. You know, you've so, like, you've seen a lot. Um, 
Wow. I mean, the more amazing one was The Tempest. Yeah. Where Pedro was Margaret Thatcher. Oh. And I remember that, that was incredible. I remember it was quite a physical th theatre, not physical theatre, but uh, yeah, it had elements of physical theatre. But um, it's far and few between where I've got anything from it. But I was cheap by Jowl did the production. Right. And I was yeah. quite taken by that. But, you know, I've, I've been to and I've seen all these. I've seen Daniel Day Lewis's Hamlet. I've seen <laughs> Fred Fines. I've, you know, I've given it a, a real good go. But no. The um the one that I remember, uh, I saw a production of Midsummer Night's Dream at the Open Air Theatre in Regent's Park. Yeah. And I, I thought it was utterly brilliant. You you might like this because it was set in the 60s, roughly. So, you know, there's the court and there's the fairyland. Yeah. Um, so the court is very much like straight society. And uh, I think it was the Indian actor Saeed Jaffrey played Oberon as an orange dressed, orange clad guru. And his <laughs> Titania was a kind of 60s babe who's gone all trippy, hippy, dippy. Yeah. Um, and, and the little fairies were, were just had guitars, they were flower children. And it was absolutely brilliant you know straight society versus dropouts led yeah. by this guru i mean i just i just thought often these quite radical changes of setting don't really work i mean the fact that it was the open air theater as well was just fabulous you know it was just sort of people strumming guitars flowers in their hair lying on the grass and yeah. then the opposite to that was was the court i mean just Utterly brilliant. You might have liked that production. I don't know. Because, um, I mean, I saw Toya in Midsummer the Night's Dream one time. That was dreadful. And then more re a couple of years ago, I saw Romeo and Juliet set in, in two-tone. That was rubbish as well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, dear me. Well, um, I mean, Toya is in the Jer Derek Jarman film. Yes. Um, which I'd have to see again, but I remember being very impressed with that. I think it's Heathcote Williams as Prospero. Um, He's going to yeah. not be as enjoyable as watching Mean Time, is it? Or, or Grown Ups or High Hopes? <laughs> is it? Look, okay. <laughs> Let's we'll dump Shakespeare. Shakespeare's over. Shakespeare is done. Um, and yeah, any, I wrote Shakespeare in the front of my first book, Isla Noises. Any weird, funny, bizarre feedback on your work so far that's quite a tricky one i mean i mean i got rejected on isle of noises by tons of different uh publishers and mm -hmm. one uh, uh you know this is a book that's featuring the great british songwriters of the last 50 years whether it's that's a shakespearean quote this aisle is full of noises. Isn't that from The Tempest? <laughs> That's what I meant in the front of the book of Isle of Noises. Ah. Uh, it's from, is, I know, I know, because be not afraid. This aisle is full of noises. There it is, a full quote. It's yeah. beautiful language, but, you know, that only, that only takes about two or three minutes to read, not five yeah. hours. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, it's a rejection. Mm -hmm. funny things um they're all negative things that are coming to mind i don't know how negative i want to be i mean as i was told one of the main protagonists told me this was the worst book i'd uh, yeah. ever been written and i was a lousy writer that was quite hard to stomach um i had the beatles book hardback he got tons of reviews for the paperback the hardback only got one review and it was really vicious and uh and the person who wrote it, I tried to help get a publishing deal. And uh, mm. his own book on the Beatles, I tried to, and I'd done everything to introduce and this and that. And um, and I was quite surprised by that as a reaction. Um, yeah, I remember having a long conversation with publisher about Isle of Noises, and they tried to tell me to rewrite the whole thing because everything, I, the way I presented it, was all totally wrong. And so it's quite hard, those kind of, yeah. Yeah. But they're, not, they're, not, they're not sort of very negative, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm not giving just, you anything. 
fun. Just listening to that, though, um, I mean, I think that is the issue with reviews, as I found when I was commissioning reviews. If you have a book on the Beatles and you then go, oh, I know somebody who's written a book on the Beatles, they'd be perfect to review this. And it often does not work at all. You know, actually, they're the worst person to review it because they've they've got their own idea or no, it should be done like this. Or he disagrees with me and I, I am right. So yeah. uh, yes, that be, can yeah. be the problem. Yes. And it wasn't really a review of the book anyway. It's a review of some little saying things here and there. It's a strange thing. But then in the, the paperback, it all shifted the other way. And uh, David Hepworth did an incredible piece for The Observer. And uh, that was wonderful. And he is a massive Fabs fan. Right. You know, but, uh, yeah. So it can work both ways, can't it, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, then, uh, and then there was a really lovely thing that a friend who worked at a record company, he wrote me an email and he said, uh, it's quite hard to say this, but there's quite a few um, factual errors in your book. Which, which I've I've written them down for you, and I really hope you take this in the spirit of done it. But perhaps you can you can look at them, and many of them, there've been a mistake with a uh, what version had finally got printed, and so some of them I was aware of, and others I were I wasn't, and I just thought what a lovely way to because because then he reviewed the book for me as well, and just as a friend, and he loved it, and he was a big Beatles fan, but he cut you know, but he wanted it to be right next time round and I thought that's the way to do it rather than be malicious about something in the, in the press <laughs> yeah yeah well that's a nice story okay well uh best of luck on the American book tour that sounds completely fantastic um I should look forward to hearing about that um I'm sure we'll meet up for a drink or something at some stage um well, we're both, uh, idler aren't we uh, oh, yeah. we're oh we're going to the Idler Festival. Yeah, they're they're working me quite hard this year. Are you working? Are you interviewing people? No, no, I'm just about two times. Oh, I'm brilliant! Nervous. Oh well, I'll drop into that. I shall come to that. I shall come and heckle. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant rubbish! It's a terrible book. Rubbish. It's not read Shakespeare. <laughs> it's a brilliant book. Okay, thank you very much for joining me in the book bag, and I will see you soon. I will see you at the Idle Festival. Bye. Bye. And thank you very much for watching. We have been talking mostly about too much, too young, brilliant story of two-tone records and all the argumentative and brilliant and talented people who formed that story by Daniel Rachel, and uh, I do recommend it. It's a wonderful book. Join me next time in the book bag, and I'll have somebody else fabulous to talk to before too long. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.